What's going on, Cage Nation? It's your boy, Kendrick Gray, the Jedi Boy here, back with the first installment of the Martial Parts series. Uh, the Martial Parts is a series that I decided to start highlighting individuals who walk the path of the warrior, who practice martial arts. So I figured this would be a way for me to get back to being consistent with the pod. So each week, Hopefully, I'll sit down with another martial artist and we'll have an interview discussion and talk about many things about the martial lifestyle. Uh, I figured I would start with me first, since I don't really talk about my martial arts, not so much my martial arts career, but my martial arts path. Um, honestly speaking, this idea actually came from one of the students here at the karate school, as you can see. I'm here in the dojo right now. I figured this would be a perfect setting for me to do this series, ideally. Um, the idea came from one of the students here who said I should really start putting out this side of my life that I never really put out too much. I've never really put out the martial arts side of my life out too, too much. If you follow me on social media, then you know I'll probably post up a picture here and there but rarely do I talk about this aspect of my life. And not, not even just him, but another person who just came into the school said I should really start presenting the martial arts side of my life so people could really understand who I am and what I do. So I figure why not even take it a step further and create a series out of this um, for the remainder of the year. So like I said, the idea is that every Sunday I will get to sit down with a martial artist and we'll discuss, you know, different aspects of training, different styles, and how they parlay the parlay, 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 rather that's the word, parlay their martial arts training into everything else in their daily lives. So whether it's film or teaching, things like that, that's what the goal is going to be. So I ideally have somebody else that I wanted to interview first on the show, but they are actually away out of town. So I'm going to try to have to get them later on at some point during the remainder of this year. So I said, it's either I'm going to either going to be the first one to do this or I'm going to be the last one to do this. And I just figured, why not be the one who breaks the ice and it's going to be me. So I'm going to be here to want to start it. So. I'm just going to give you my entire martial arts life story and see who else jumps at the chance to want to share theirs as well. Of course, be sure to like, share, and comment, and subscribe. Follow me on all the social medias. I am no longer on Twitter. I am no longer on X. I got rid of that because I barely use it anyway. So you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I am actually now on Threads, so you can find me on Threads as well. Um, of course, the, po the podcast will be on Spotify and all the podcast streaming services. So be sure to, you know, follow me then and there. So first things first, let me do this the right way. I am going to stand up. Back up a little bit. And I am going to greet in to this podcast. Oops! From there. That is how we get courtesy here in our dojo. I know most other schools go with the OSU, which is U, which is O S U. Ours is U S H. That is our culture here in this dojo, and that's how we do that. And judging by what you saw with my current rank, my name is actually Kiyoshi Kendrick Gray. That is my actual rank and title. I am a seventh degree black belt. Um, here in the Shaquille School of Martial Arts, that's what this dojo is. Um, the Shaquille School of Martial Arts is a school that's been around for over 40 years. This, this dojo has been in existence for over 40 years. The instructor, my instructor, the original head instructor, was Grandmaster Kevin Thompson. Um, if you're out there on the tournament circuit or in the sport karate world, then you know who Kevin Thompson is. He was a prominent figure in, he was born in North, he was a prominent figure in the martial arts scene. From the time he started training up until when he passed away. Um, many of you guys know who don't know about Grandmaster Kevin Thompson actually passed away right in the beginning of 2020. 
Uh, he had been diagnosed with ALS. He had been fighting that disease from 2013 all the way to 2020. So he held on for a very long time. Uh, most people know that um, ALS is a disease that usually takes between three to five years to do its damage to the body. It is a neuromuscular disease, something like that. It eats away at the um, nerves that help control the muscles in the body. So you get to a point where you can't really move the body on your own. But as I mentioned before, he held on for almost 10 years um, with the disease. Um, I, I say he, I say 2013 to 2020, but honestly speaking, I feel like the signs started showing back in 2010. That's when the signs really started showing. And he didn't officially, officially get diagnosed with it until maybe 2012. That's when he officially got diagnosed with the disease. So, needless to say, um, his contributions to the martial arts world have been staggering honestly you know he's been in black belt magazine he's traveled all over the world competing in weapons forms and fighting he was given the name the total package because of the intensity and just his commitment to all aspects of the martial arts lifestyle but outside of that outside of just the tournament scene his dedication to the martial arts is what was unwavering it was unwavering it's for the reason why this school is still in existence to this day right now his son kevin thompson jr is the current owner and head instructor of the school um spoilers he he's the person that i wanted to be on here first i wanted to interview him first get an interview in an in-depth interview with him but he is actually in europe right now so once he comes back hopefully we can schedule that interview and do that so um Needless to say, that's just a little bit of backstory. This particular style of martial arts that we practice here is called American Karate Do. American Karate Do is a descendant from the KA system of Karate. If you guys are familiar with many of the um, pillars of North, the KA system was started by Al Mawasis Korean Abdullah, who brought it from North, who brought it to North from his in original instructor, um, Sensei James Cheatham. Sensei James Cheatham was a martial artist who practiced overseas in Japan under under the art of Shitoru. So to follow the lineage, we here at the Shakyo School of Martial Arts are descendants or disciples of Shitoru Karate. That's where um, our style originally comes from. Of course, what, like many things, things have changed and evolved over time. The KA system of Karate was really just more of a fighting system. Uh, um, Alma Wasser was known to have about seven standard styles and then like 18 sub styles within those other styles. So our style is based off of standard style straight fighting position, which is like a normal karate stance, but with our hands going straight, arms and body going straight. So it's, it's pretty standard. That was the style that Grandmaster Kevin Thompson was given as he began his training and that's where he continued to train throughout the throughout the remainder of his life um the ka system of course as i mentioned before was just a fighting system so it wasn't until people like grandmaster kevin thompson would come in and start introducing katas and weapons into the actual curriculum um alma watches has gone on record himself as saying that you know, you couldn't ask him to do the same kata twice because kata was never a thing, his thing. Fighting was his thing. So he would make up a kata on the spot, but he couldn't remember it after it was done. Grandmaster Kevin Thompson was actually the one who implemented standard sets of katas within the system. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, the basic definition, or at least our definition of kata here is that it's a form of fighting imaginary men using kicks, blocks, and punches in all directions. I usually equate it to the students, I usually equate it to shadow boxing, almost. Kata can be seen as shadow boxing. So if anyone ever tells you kata doesn't make any sense or shot shadow boxing doesn't make any sense, just make those two comparisons. Just make those two connections right there. Um, I chose me coming here to the school, starting here, um, really just happened to be, I tell people it was happenstance. Um, this school has had a couple of locations 
like I said, it originally started in Newark. That was the first location. And then we had a couple of locations. We had one in Montclair. Again, New Jersey. New Jersey. So we had a school. Our first school was in Newark. We had a school in Montclair. And then we had two other schools in East Orange. At the time, I was we had just moved to Montclair. Um, 94, um, my family moved to Montclair from Newark, as a matter of fact. And after that first year, that second year, um, 1995, um, that's when my attention to the martial arts really came into play. You know, like a lot of other kids around the time, we had the Ninja Turtles, we had the Power Rangers, you know, we had um, all the other martial arts movies, martial arts stars, you know, the Steven Seagal's, the um, Jean-Claude Van Damme's, Bruce Lee's, things like that. We had all those guys. So martial arts was still really prevalent around the time of the mid to late 90s. So it just so happened that this school, at least this school in Montclair, was literally two doc two blocks away from us. We lived on the main strip of Bloomfield Avenue. We were up the street and the school was down the street. So I would walk past it from time to time and I would take a peek in and see what's going on the side. And once I officially decided that I really wanted to start, that's where I got my start. So in March of 1995 is when I started my training here at the Shack Hill School of Martial Arts. Um, so that was, that was really it. That's really it. It wasn't like anything particular. I didn't really know much about the school until, or much about the instructor or anything like that until I was actually here. It To me, it was just another karate school and it just happened to be close by. I could walk to the school whenever there was class. So, it, it again, it was just right place, right time, essentially. It was the right place, right time. Um, as I mentioned, I've been here since 1995. That's how long I've been here. So, next year, next year will mark, I believe, yeah, next year will mark 30 years I've been in the martial arts. Next year, March, March 2025 will be my 30th martial arts birthday. Honestly, it'll be my 30th martial, excuse me, anniversary here at the Shack Hill School of Martial Arts. So that is going to, that's going to be kind of special. Maybe I'll do something special for it. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I've never really been one to do that. I mean, I mentioned it earlier in the beginning of this episode that I've never been one to really, 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 really talk about the martial arts side of my life unless people ask me about it. So, but I'm going to try to get better at really expressing that side of me. Um, like I said, um, Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers, martial arts movies, things like that. I didn't have too many friends that took martial arts around that time. Uh, ironically, one of the friends I made when I moved to Montclair was actually coming to this school, but he didn't stay here very long. Shout out to my boy, John Henry. Um, but the thing that kept me motivated, at least around that time, the thing that kept me motivated was just the learning. It was me just getting stronger. I did make friends when I was here. Um, it's just the overall aspect of everything here. You know, some of the preconceived notions that I had about the martial arts, you know, were definitely changed up a little bit. You know, as a person who played Mortal Kombat, you know, all, all, their, li all their life, you know. I mean, to me, I thought a roundhouse kick was what we saw in the game. Not not learning that a roundhouse kick is something completely different. And the kick that you're actually doing in the game, or at least the earlier iterations of Mortal Kombat, was a spinning hook kick. So there's a lot of things that I um didn't really need to unlearn, but a lot of things that I definitely needed to understand. Um ironically it was that same year that like that same year December I would actually get promoted to advanced white belt or yellow belt here in, a, in our in our dojo um so you figure ten, so yeah literally 10 months in 10 months i was able to move up to my next rank um don't ask me to remember any of my other um under belt promotions uh i only remember my first promotion and i remember my black belt promotion those are the only promotions i really remember um, my mom would probably have the certificates to my other belt promotion, so I would have to ask her so I could put that on record. 
Um, I would definitely say my first experience in the dojo was a very interesting one. Um, I remember it was a Friday, which is usually our kata classes. Um, and the head instructor was there. Master Kevin Thompson was there. Um, I had been working with a senpai at the time. Um, and um, needless to say, I was very... I was discouraged. But at the same time, I wasn't. Because at the time, she was... I guess the best word would be impatient. You know, she didn't... She didn't like the effect that I wasn't really catching on to what she was teaching me. I mean, it's my first class, so what exactly do I absolutely know about kata? I didn't know anything, so I was trying my best. Um, but I would continue to go. I think I went that Saturday. I went back, and I just kept coming back. I just kept coming back until the point where I finally got it. Um, one of the things I tell the students here that I told myself back then was I needed to figure out a way that she wasn't going to keep yelling at me or making me do push-ups for making mistakes. So what I ended up doing was, because we, of course, we have a booklet, we have a manual of all the techniques here in the dojo. I, I think even before I even got my manual, I just started making connections to one set of techniques to another. You know, once I realized that, a lot of our basic white belt katas were based off of our blocks. I was like, okay, if all I have to do is change the block, then technically speaking, I know all the katas. So that's what I did. And eventually it came to a point where she, she wasn't angry with me anymore. She actually enjoyed, as far as I know, as far as I know, I, I feel like she enjoyed, you know, teaching me for a degree. Um, she, was, she was very intense. Shout out to... Um, Wazir and Naima Trima. Shout out to her. So, but um, she was my first senpai. She was my first senpai. Um, around that time, um, you know, Grandmaster Kevin Thompson didn't teach. He didn't teach all the classes, of course. You know, he only taught. He taught the Friday classes, which were college classes, and he would teach the advanced students. Um, the other senseis, or the other yeah, the other senseis, they taught the other classes. They taught the underbelts. And things like that. Um, in our school, we call them wazirs. Wazir is wazir is an Arabic term, which means assistant instructor. So that's also the other title I go by, which is wazir. Um, we've been on this quick side note. We've been implementing a lot more of the traditional Japanese martial arts titles into the system. So again, Kiyoshi is my official title. Before I was just going by Shihan, which means master master instructor. But Wazir is just a title that I hold dear because of the connection to the Grandmaster Kevin Thompson. So I always tell people, you can still always just call me Wazir. In any, in any case, um, that was my first class. That was my first class. And every training session was just like that. Um, there was very few um, examples of what a, cla a, karate cla a karate class was like on TV. I mean, yes, we had the Karate Kid. You know, but that's different. You know, that's fictionalized, to, so to speak. And yet, other martial arts movies and other TV shows. But you know, just judging from what I've seen, not only just in our school but in other schools, you know, our intense intensity level was just way up there. Everything was high energy, high intensity, and always under pressure. That's pretty much how our dojo environment was, and still pretty much is. Um. You know, a typical class, which is which, which really hasn't changed much, is always been pretty simple. We warm up jumping jacks, usually 50 to 100, a little bit more, 200, 300, if we're feeling froggy that day. Um, you know, laps, running in place, squats, stretching out push-ups, you know, that's just a warm-up. And then we get into the... Uh, basics and then we enter the meat and potatoes of the class which is the main thing that we focus on in class you know classes used to be an hour you know here now classes are about 45 minutes unless you're an adult adults you get a lot a lot longer time back in the day especially in the early days classes were like three to four hours you know if i get one of the older um or the elder statesmen of the dojo if i get them on the pod they can tell you these things but 
you know, classes used to be a lot longer back in the day when, you know, Grandmaster was a lot younger and just full of energy. But, you know, we dialed it back down just to make it a little more accommodating for a lot of other people. Um, and that, that, would, that would be a general training session. And again, it hasn't really changed much since I'm doing most of the teaching here. It hasn't really changed much. It's still the same thing, warm-ups, you know, go through basics, get to the meat and potatoes, you know, last-minute exercise, last-minute stretch down. And then we greet out. You know, that's pretty much how that goes. Um, I tell people, I tell people quite often that this and the martial arts and outside go hand in hand. Um, the, head of, the grandmaster used to always have a saying that, or not a saying, but he always says that this, as far as the martial arts are concerned, you know, we teach martial arts as a way of life. I think for far too long, and even still to this day, even still to this day, um, a lot of people just see martial arts as an extracurricular activity, you know, something for the, something for the kids to do after school, or something for kids to do on the weekends, or just here and there when they have the free time, you know, like, oh, I need my kid to do something, so I'll just, I'll just throw him in the, in the karate, like, no, no. The martial arts lifestyle is exactly what it is. It is a lifestyle. You know, it incorporates combining your spirit, your mind, and your body to all work in tandem with each other. You can always tell who's fully immersed into the martial arts lifestyle and who's just here because they either have to, they feel like they have to be here or they're just here to just take up some time. I tell people all the time, if you're going to go into the martial arts, you have to go in all the way. There is, There are no if, nah, ands, or buts about it. You have to go in all the way. If you cannot do that, then the martial arts is not for you. It, 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 it's really not. Um, everywhere I go, my martial arts is with me. You know, um, we have people from all walks of life that have come through these doors. We've had judges. We've had lawyers. We've had teachers, doctors. You know, the Grandmaster himself was an educator. He was a teacher in the public school system. Um, before he retired, he got, he got he worked up to vice principal at the school he was at. So, the martial arts really is for every single aspect of your life. From the way you carry yourself outside when you're walking up and down the street. You know, if you've trained in the arts, then you can tell... Who, who else is trained outside just by the way they move, just by how they way they talk and interact with the other people around them. Uh, even me, my antennas are always up, not out of fear, but just out of awareness, just making sure I'm always mindful of who is in front of me, who's behind me, who's on the side of me, where am I at, where am I going, where am I coming from, things like that. Um, it's, it's even got to the point where I'm in education right now, um, I am currently back in school so I can become a full-fledged teacher right now I'm just working as a power professional and I've been doing I've been doing that since 2013 um, honestly speaking I've been in education for a while because my first job <laughs> once getting into high school was working at an after-school program at a car at a Montessori school right in Montclair shout out to the Montclair Cooperative School um, I was in after school counselor there I would work there during the summer for maintenance and even during the summer camp and essentially after that I just transitioned over to being a power professional and now again I am on track to becoming a full-fledged teacher so it, could, it definitely influences you in ways that you cannot imagine and it does sadden me it does sadden me when certain students leave that I know would have been great here because of how much of a benefit this is to just your overall lifestyle but at the same time we can't hold them here we just can't um, to me excuse me the core principles of martial arts the core principles of martial arts are being open-minded is open-mindedness you know self-discipline self-control 
and most importantly, self-awareness. And that's been a, that's honestly speaking, that's been a big thing of mine for like maybe the past two years is just self-awareness. Um, I'm, I'm amazed these days at the lack of self-awareness in a lot of people these days. A lack of it, especially in children. Uh, it, it re it's re really in children because, like I said, I work in the school system, so I see it firsthand. I see the lack of situational, societal self-awareness in a lot of these children. And yes, I am aware that a lot of it stems from us being locked into technology a great deal. I, I, I do understand that. I know technology plays a big part in the lack of self-awareness in a lot of people. But I do feel that there's ways to work around that. You know, I am I'm I, I'm actually working on a um, like a self awareness manual for the students. We have we have so we have manuals here, like I mentioned before, manuals that contain all of the techniques and things that they're going to learn throughout their training here in the dojo. I've also been working on trying to construct a self-awareness menu because I believe especially these days children have to have a particular level of self-awareness not to, I'm, and I'm not talking as existential crisis level awareness type of stuff I'm not talking about that I'm, I'm just talking about just like what, what, what like one of the biggest things in the school not, not even just here, but in, in, in my job. One of the biggest things for me is just being aware of the things you say. You know, we, we, we got a lot of, there's a lot of talk about brain rot language. You know, you know, you, you probably hear kids using words like skibbity toilet or, um, you know, riz, phantom tax, you know, a, a lot of social media slang. A lot of social media slang is what you see a lot of happening out there in the world and the one thing I usually ask kids <laughs> when they use language of like that is like do you know what that means like if you don't know what that means then you probably shouldn't be using that word because I know what it means now if you do know what it means and you know it's not appropriate to be using in a school setting again don't use that word so so it's like something as simple as language how you talk or how you address people like it, it's it's a big it's a big thing to me only because you know I felt like myself my my awareness of self really came during my teen years you know like when I was in the midst of my training here you know like I would say around my purple belt around my purple belt like my extra like that my my full self-awareness came to be around that time and I've always and I've always just tried to make sure it stays intact. And that's my biggest thing. My biggest thing is making sure the kids these days are self aware because it's easy to get caught up. It's very easy to get caught up in a lot of what's going on on social media or what's going on in the world of fantasy and fame and things like that. It's very easy to lose yourself. And we have to make sure we stay grounded. This is one of the, this. This is a big thing for me. This was one of the big factors in me staying grounded, because I knew who I was and I knew what my, I was capable of doing. So I had to just keep that in mind. Um, that's that's one thing that keeps me motivated. I think the the other thing that really also keeps me motivated to continue doing this not just the betterment of the students, but it's the betterment of myself. You know, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people who've come through these doors, a lot of people who've come through any martial arts doors. You know, they're all about the training, which is cool. That, that's cool, that's okay, being all about the training, but they're like super, 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 super deathly afraid of teaching. They're just afraid of giving that knowledge off to somebody else. And many reasons vary. Maybe they don't feel sharp or confident in their technique or their knowledge. I understand that. Maybe they don't really have the capacity 
to stand in front of students, mostly mo more, more generally kids, and give off information. Some people don't either don't have the um, patience for it, or they just don't have the, you know, mindset for it. You know, not every not everyone can be a teacher, not everyone can be an instructor, but. I, I found enjoyment in teaching. I mean, he, he had me he had me assisting him in teaching when I was a purple belt. That he I was I had to have been like about 13, 14 at the time. He had me assisting him in teaching classes during the week. As a matter of fact, it got to a point where even before I became a brown belt, I was teaching the younger kids. I was teaching the Mighty Mites. Brown Belt, I was teaching a whole class by myself. I was I was teaching a weapons class by myself at Brown Belt. And then once I became, you know, Black Belt, once I became Shodan, um, it was just off to the rails right there. there, there I, I should mention, I did take a small hiatus from the dojo. Uh, well, not really small. It was like a four-year hiatus from the dojo. Only because I relocated to Florida. Uh, I relocated to Florida because my dad was living there. I was living there with him and um, his wife for those four years because he wanted to, I guess, for lack of a better word, he wanted to help me get, help me move forward, you know, as far as life is because he felt like he, he felt I would do better down in Florida. Turns out that I didn't. I didn't really do better in Florida. Um, Florida, to me, started to go off on a tangent here, but Florida, to me, was a very slow pace. You know, coming from up here, coming from Jersey, coming from the Tri-State area, where things are on a fast pace, going down there felt like an extreme slowdown. Like, like I mentioned before, I got my first official job at 14 years old, working at an after-school program. I, so at that point, I was used to working. It took me forever to find a job down there. Like, I don't think I found a job until right before summer vacation down there. And I'm the type of person that likes to have his own money. So it, everything was just a bit too slow down. I mean, there, there, are some, there are some positive aspects. Don't, don't get me wrong. I've met a lot of great people. Great people. I made a lot of great friends down there. But at the end of the day, there was just some things I couldn't stand about Florida. So I just had to come back here. And... True to fashion, the Grandmaster just said, come on back, you know, just roll right back in. And that's what I did. I came right back, jumped right back on the floor. Struggled a little bit because I hadn't really trained when I was away. But I fell right back into the rhythm of everything. And at that point, you know, he gave me a couple more classes to teach. And most lo mostly on the weekends, you know, Friday, Saturday. Wednesdays was our, is our, was our sparring class. I would be there for that, too. Um, so... Yeah, that's that's how that got started. That's how that got started. So, um, being an instructor entails a lot. It, it really entails a lot. You know, constantly keeping sharp of what you know. You know, constantly keeping sharp of what you know. Like you know, they the nickname they have for me here in the dojo is the Almanac because I know I pr I practically know all the manuals. I know all the te techniques front, front and back. Um, before the Grandmaster got to a point where he couldn't, really couldn't move or really couldn't talk, he pretty much gave me the last bit of information needed here. So, like all the cuts that we have here is up here. Terminologies, techniques, all up here. You know, he gave me the last bit of information. You know, before he couldn't, before he didn't have the time to give it to me anymore. So, and. I know. I'm, I'm, he, I, he used to tell the story, honestly, when he would talk about me. He used to tell the story to people about how one day, I think I was a brown belt at the time. I was a brown belt. And normally our stripe testing, our, our you know, stripe testing on our belts, back then were usually him asking us questions from the manual. That's usually how it went. Or at least one of our stripes would be questions from the manual. And, and his attempt to try to trip me up, he asked me, for a set of techniques backwards. 
So I believe it was the 10 advanced fighting combinations. He asked me that to give us from, from 10 to 1. And just like that, I gave it to him, starting from number 10 all the way down to number 1. And he, 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 tells, he said he couldn't say anything after that. You know, he said he, he, said, he, said he was going to try to trip him up because one of the things um, that's always been, I guess, a descriptor of me here in the dojo is, I mean, I, I guess you can say the almanac description has always been a thing, even before I became a black belt. The almanac thing has always been a descriptor of me. Um, I remember a lot of my other friends here in the dojo, you know, I remember there was, there was actually one time we were, we were in weapons class and, um, uh, grandmaster asked us a question and, you know, I gave the answer at one of the other students like, is he right? And then my boy, uh, um, shout out to Wazir Abdul Malik said like, how are you going to ask him? He knows everything. So it was just like, wow. And it's like, when you hear things like that, it's just like, wow, it puts things in perspective. When you're just sitting there, it's like, oh man. And it's like, it is, and it's, and again, it's only because I, I just wanted that information on, on hand. I, I wanted it solid up here. And again, especially when I started teaching, it's like, I have to know this stuff like the back of my hand. Otherwise, how can I give it off? It's not going to work that way if I don't know it. So, the almanac description of me has always kind of been there. Uh, I think there's just a general understanding that everybody knew that I knew everything here. At least up until that point, I knew everything here. And again, this isn't me tooting my own horn. It's just, this is, this is just how I operated. You know, again, I took those manuals. I made a connection from one set of techniques to the other. So it was just like, I, I just wanted to know I'm the type of person that likes to know what he's doing. I just like to know what I'm doing, even if it's just up here. I may not know it physically, but I just want to know what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, that 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 that's 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 what I that's that's how that works. Um, and of course, respect and humility go go a long way here. I've I've said before, and I'll say it again. You know. One of the first things you're going to have to do when you start the martial arts is check your ego at the door. And these days, I know it can be very, 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 very hard to do that because everything's about exposure now. Everything's about being seen or people recognizing you. And to me, that was never my thing. To me, that was never my thing. So, so hindsight 2020. This is another reason why I'm doing this. Again, you know, I mentioned before that it was two of the other black belts here that that put the bug in my ear that I should really share this aspect of my life with the public. Um, they they would say like people need to see this, and for as long as I've been doing this, for as long as I've been training, I've never felt the need to be in a spotlight. That was never my thing. You know, you know, if my grandmaster were alive today, he he would tell you how many tournaments I've competed in. You know, tournaments was never a big thing. I, I I would only really compete if I felt extremely confident confident enough that I know I could win or if it was close or if or if he asked me to or if the grandmaster asked me to compete. Like we used to have our own tournament called the New Jersey Open. I made sure I competed in that, but other than that, tournaments were never my thing. Those weren't those tournaments weren't weren't really my concern. You know, did I did I have fun doing it? Of course, excuse me. Of course I did. Of course I had fun competing, but that was never my focus. My focus was the training. That was my focus: the training and the understanding of this art. That's all it was. You know, so you know, um, and every place has them. Every activity has it. They always have those people that think extremely highly of themselves you know they think they're the best that they can't be stopped things like that you know that's all well ago until you get knocked on your butt that 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 was never me you know i never thought of myself better than anybody else here 
I just focused on the training and the learning. That that's all I focused on. Um, so definitely one of the biggest things. Like I said, check your ego at the door. Um, you've seen the reference of I can't fill your cup if your cup is already full with all this knowledge that you have. You have to empty your cup in order to learn something new. You have to empty your mind in order to learn something new. That's And that's how I try to approach things on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I know I don't know everything. I am not the smartest man in the world. If you can teach me something, great. You know, I, I, just, I just know where my limits lie. I know where I stand on certain things. So I try to make sure I keep a level head on a certain thing, you know. If you come in here thinking or expecting or have this idea that you're the best because people keep telling you, first and foremost, you got to prove it to me. Prove it to us. Prove it to the students here. And if you get knocked on your butt, that means you got a lot more to learn. And it is what it is. We all, it happens to all of us. You know, we can't have that ego, that heat, that ego has to stay on the outside of these doors. It's as simple as that. You know, respect, courtesy, you know, being able, being open to criticism, being open to, you know, understanding. And that's that's what all of this is about. Um, like I said, I can probably count maybe on two hands how many tournaments I've been to. And normally, we we spend a good, we spend a great deal of time. I mean, honestly, all the training we do in class was tournament ready. To be honest with you, all the training we do in class is tournament ready. Um, like even now we have a, we have a team, we have a karate team that travels, you know, all over competing is mostly kids at this point because most of our student body is kids. So they actually do team trainings on Saturday, you know, so they can understand the, at the game, understand the game of competition because that is a game and it's important to understand how those things work. So mentally, you know, it's just about making sure everything I know is on point. And physically, it's just getting in here and getting the work done. You know, um, I've probably trained more for belt promotions than I have for tournaments, though. Um, when I was going for my um, knee down, when I was going for my knee down, um, our, our actual test here usually would consist of a two-mile run. We had to do 500 punches, 500 kicks, 200 sit-ups, and 200 push-ups. I spent maybe... From the time I found out about my promotion date up until the promotion date, I was at the park every day, almost every day or every other day, hitting my two miles. I was here in the dojo, you know, going over my techniques, going over my basics. You know, it was a thing that I know I wanted to accomplish, so I had to get myself prepared for it. Same thing with the competition. I will drill over a kata 10, 15, 20 times to make sure it's correct. Drill over my weapons kata 10, 15, 20 times. Sparring. You know, I can just borrow my dojo brothers or whoever. And, you know, just keep it like that. <laughs> it's not even just for competition, but for demonstrations. You know, when we create a routine, when we create a demo routine, we got to make sure that's on point and we're moving sharp, fast, and at the same time. So, all the training we've ever had here, at least in this school, all the training we've had here, it prepares us for a lot of this stuff. And we got to do an impromptu demonstration somewhere. We know how to move because... Our training has allowed us to move in a certain way. So that's that's how that works. Um, I don't think I've ever had a favorite technique. Actually, yeah, I do. I would say the fa my favorite technique is the back fist. That's my favorite technique. Only because it's quick. It's fast. You know, I could pop you real quick, you know, out of nowhere. You know, so... Um, I don't really do much kicking. I mean, I kick, but I don't really do much kicking these days. You know, back when I was a purple belt, when I was a purple, I was trying everything. Everything, you know, the grandmaster taught me, I was trying out. Especially during our sparring class, I was trying out everything. So, spinning, hook kicks, you know, stuff like that. I was trying them all out, you know. As I've got, as I got older and higher in rank, you know, I was settled on a few techniques that I know are gonna hit, that I know, that I know are going to score. You know, that back fist, you know, because people used to tell my back fist was quick. And, you know, 
I mean, yes, I'm bigger now, but when I was slimmer, I was still tall. I was a tall kid, but people were amazed at how fast I was for being that tall. So I would say the back fist is because, again, right here, front hand, pop, right there. I get, I just catch you right there, a little lean on it, pop you right in the face, you're good. Pop you right in the face, right there, that's it. I, that's, that's all I really needed. If I'm sparring, you know, as long as you're close to me and I can grab you, then I can do what I want. Um, it requires a great deal of balance and a great deal of speed. And as many who who train, you understand that that's very important. You know, it can be very easy to get knocked off your balance if you're not sitting in a stable position. Even if you're standing up in a, if you're not stable, you can get knocked over. Um, Speed comes with just constant practice. So this is, I guess this is my little advice section here. Speed just comes with constant practice, you know. You may not be faster than the instructor. You may not be faster to one of your other dojo classmates. But if you, if there's certain things that you can't do fast, there might be other things that you can, you know. We used to work on speed drills a lot here. A lot, a lot, you know. Trying to shoot that front leg round us kick out as fast as possible. Shoot that reverse punch out that back fist out you know you know even moving out the way just sidestepping has to be done in a timely fashion otherwise you get caught out there um my 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 approach my approach to training in general my approach to training is just simply just work on it and, and I, well well what I tell what I tell the students is what I tell the students is usually you have to be able to throw something correctly at least a good I'll tell the students at least five times at least five you know because it's a class so we got to keep things moving but you know my grandmaster's philosophy practice something until every single time you throw it every single time you do it there's little to no mistakes you don't got to worry about anything you know that that was his philosophy you know so that's what I tell the kids. That's what I tell the students. You gotta practice something so much muscle memory. That was a that was also that's also a big thing here, muscle memory. The fact that if you practice something or do something so much, your body will just naturally do it at some point. That's whole that's the whole point. So that's pretty much how I, I look at it. You know, you gotta practice something so much that you can do it without thinking about it, you know. So that, that that's the that's the point you got to get to. And that's the point you got to get to. Um, my as far as like conditioning and fitness, you know, either daily or every other day. You know, the moment you the moment you get stagnated or the moment you get comfortable not doing anything that's when that's when the bad things start to set in you gotta constantly keep moving you know even as I teach you know I have to be moved I, I move with them I move with them not only so they can see what they're supposed to do but I keep my body in motion also a body what is it a body in motion stays in motion I think that's the, that's the term that's the phrase if I'm not mistaken um, I remember that um, we also worked on being mindful. Again, like I mentioned before, self-awareness is a big thing for me. And meditation, you know, meditation can be some, some meditation can be something just sitting in one spot for a good minute, letting your mind clear or laying down for a minute. You know, uh, we had yoga here for a little bit. We're going to be getting yoga back, so yoga was a big help. You know, being able to just sit in one spot and let your mind just clear and put everything that's going on on the outside of these doors to the side for right now is highly highly important and it's something something we haven't really done in a while we brought it back here and there but we haven't made it really 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 official yet so that's something we're going to be reintroducing back into the system as well just meditation and just being able to sit still um flexibility is is so important so so very important now i'm not as flexible as i used to be i am 40 years old mind you i am 40 years old and i will admit that i don't stretch as often as i should 
I do need to get back to that. But, you know, the, we have the students stretched here on a regular basis. A lot of students on their own just stretch. It's, it's, it's not even just to be super flexible just to get your kick all the way up there. It's not even about that. It's just to keep your body loose because once your body tightens up, it becomes very hard to do just a lot of normal, normal things. Um, so that's very, very, very key. Um, I wasn't always the tallest person here. Um, there are points where I used to have fight big people bigger than me. Um, so, and, and this is something I tell the students right now. When it comes to fighting someone who is bigger than you, the truth is you as the smaller person are supposed to have the element of speed on your side. So you're supposed to be able to move faster than the person in front of you. Some of them get it, some of them don't. But that's something I had to learn fighting someone who was bigger than me when I was coming up. I had to be faster. I had to be able to move, move, get in and get right out. Um, that's, that's, that's kind of how you got to think about it. You know, we, we see it in movies, we see it on animes, TV shows, things like that. The smaller person is supposed to be the faster person. So if you got this element of speed on your side, that's what you need to use. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, the martial arts is really is a way of life and the discipline of the martial arts the discipline of the martial arts is de something that's definitely been prominent in my life as well even right now um from the way i clean my area you know or just keep it clean because i i'm a clean person i like to keep or at whatever area i'm at i like to keep clean organized Usually because I, I usually tell people, like, if I need to go grab something, I would like to get it where I put it last. And if my area is clean, I can go right there and get it. Um, just just from everything, from, you know, getting up in the morning to go to work. I get up, do my routine in the bathroom, get dressed, you know, grab my belongings. I'm out the door to head to work, you know, even when I drive. <laughs> Honestly speaking, even when I drive, you know, I move in a way where the lane I need to get to so I can, when I'm on the parkway, the lane I need to get to so I can get to my exit faster, I make sure I get there from the start. You know, I, um, I, 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 I try to move in a linear path, as much as a linear path as possible. You know, obstacles are going to come and get in the way. That just goes without saying it's life. But I try to move in a way where I at least know exactly what's going to happen or what I need to do to get to where I need to go so I don't get caught off guard. Monkey wrenches are going to get thrown in, you know, again, that's life also, but you got to be ready to deal with those. You know, so it's, it's funny because um, <clears throat> my wife right now, uh, we've been together for... 10 years we've been together for 10 years we've been married two. we've been married two years um well it actually getting ready to go on three years next year next year will be a three-year wedding anniversary um i'm the clean one she's the messy one that, that that's, that's kind of how it is. i'm the clean one you know i i like things in its place i like things in order i like being able to get to something without no obstacles in the way i like being able to find things that i need to find things like that her not so much, but we are we're, we're we're working on that. We are working on that. Um, when I look at self defense, just the concept of self defense as a as a whole, I look at it as just simply the preservation of self. You know, the world right now. It's a very tricky one to navigate through. You know, just recently, like literally this week, we we had another we had another shooting at a school. Four people out there, two teachers and two students. And this whole argument about gun regulation and gun laws is like it's kind of an asinine argument. It's already been proven that states that have the strictest gun laws don't have these incidents. At least not as frequent as other states that have lenient gun, um, gun laws. 
the idea of self defense is a concept that I feel like everybody should be should be should be should consider. You know. I mean, depending on where you live, you know, you're probably not going to run into a lot of crazy individuals, but that doesn't mean you should not just be lax and unprepared. You know, I keep a karambit on me. I, I keep a karambit in my pouch. I have a pocket knife in my um, book bag. I keep... I keep a weapon in the car. I, I, I keep a weapon in the car. I keep a weapon in the house. You know, not a firearm, at least not yet, but I keep, I keep stuff to protect me all over the place that I need to get to. You know, Grandmaster kept a wooden stick in his car. You know, it's about not getting caught off guard. You know, I gave my wife a knife to carry around with her if she ever needs it. I have, I have a two-year-old daughter. You know, when she gets older... I'm going to give her something to carry on with her, too, for protection. Again, it's about it's about self. It's about getting home at the end of the day. Self-defense is really about getting home. It's about getting home. That's what it is. You know, we have this thing here called the AIR concept, which is, which is part of our self-defense program, the AIR concept, which stands for awareness, instinct, and reaction. When you're outside, your antenna should always be up. Even if you're relaxed and just out enjoying time, your antenna should always be up. Should always be around your surroundings, what you're close by, what you're far away from home, who you're walking around, and things like that. Instinct. If you start to get an inkling that maybe the situation may not be to your favor, how do you move from that? You know, is it a thing where if you see a group of people in front of you and you're not really sure how that group is moving, cross the street. You know jump into a store for a little bit until that group passes or something, things like that. And if you get caught up in the stuff, if you get caught up in a mix, you gotta react. Hit, go, go home. That's how that is. That, that, that's how that works. Um, it's, um, everyone needs to know some form of self-defense. Everyone. Everyone everyone because there's too many things happening out here for us to not have something in our back pocket that could keep us protected to at least some form or fashion <laughs> when I look at the term Bushido when I look at that you know I look at it is the complete understanding of your martial self if, if you know there's certain things you can't do that's okay. If you know there's certain ways you can't move, that's okay. If you know the area where you live isn't all that great, that's okay. The idea of Bushido doesn't just, to me, doesn't just stick within the realm of martial arts. That goes without through your life also. Everything, everything is martial arts. To a degree, everything is martial arts. You know, if you gotta scratch somebody's eyes out, that's martial arts. If you gotta bite somebody on the leg, that's martial arts. You know, uh, shot to the groin, martial arts. You know, things like that. We have to be able to see what it is that's going on around us and just be mindful of it. Uh, Bushido, of course, is really more the code of the samurai. And, you know, this, the way of the samurai, you know, is just being able to move, move directly from one goal to the next. You know, honor, respect, you know, disciplining yourself, moving in accordance with, you know, what makes sense. That, to me, is Bushido. Nothing is ever wasted. Everything has a use. Everything has a purpose. That's what that to me. That's what bushido means to me. Um, being able to balance the physical and aspect, physical and spiritual aspects of martial arts. That's bushido also, because you got you. We've seen people who spend so much time on the physical aspect that they're not understanding the philosoph philosophical side of what the martial arts is really about. 
or you got people who pontificate way too much about the martial arts but then can't really lift a finger or can't really move the body the way it needs to move if you have to execute something. The yin and yang. Two sides of the same coin. Both require a little bit of everything. Yes, physicality is important, but there has to be a little bit of spirituality in that. Being a spiritual person is one thing, but your body has to be able to do something and move. Um, which is why things like that will help f to prevent, you know, the martial arts being used for harmful purposes. Um, anything can be used to harm somebody. Anything. It's 2024, guys. Anything can be used to harm someone. Um, I know the martial arts has been viewed as one of the things that's not supposed to be used for that, but you, you, you again, it's 2024. You know, and this is nothing against the rise of mixed martial arts, but how many people have you seen get into fights who train in mixed martial arts? And again, this is nothing against the art itself, but it's about being mindful. And we, we, we do it here. We, we do it right here. We make sure that the students who are on this floor are on this floor for the right reason. You know, they're not here to just win trophies or you know prevent bullying which is a pretty substantial reason to prevent bullying yes but you know essentially you have to come to a point where like what do you really want out of the martial arts how is it going to benefit your life in the long run that's what you got to understand that's what that's what people have to start thinking about you know it's it's, it's not just physical harm that comes from Martial arts can't. It, martial arts can't just be used for physical harm. It can be used to intimidate people. It can be used to intimidate people that don't need to be intimidated. It can be used to make someone feel inferior. Things like that. You know, you don't want to. You don't want to do that. Yes, there are many different belt levels here, but we are all on the same path. Like we tell the students here, a white belt is just a black belt is just a dirty white belt. A black belt is the belt that has been through the fight. Has been through the training sweat blood tears dirt all that stuff that's what a black belt is it is your white belt getting dirty from putting in the work you know so to think that you're better than somebody else because you have this rank on doesn't mean it, it, it that, that's that, that's not what we do here again i'm still wazir just because i have this rank doesn't mean you know all this means that my knowledge of this stuff is just a little bit more than yours be only because I've been here longer, but at the same time, we're all on the same martial arts training boat. You know, we're all trying to get to the same goal, all right? Which is excellence, martial excellence. That's what we're going to, looking for. Um, I guess we can um get into a couple of little personal questions and things like that. Um, I did have some big challenges here. I definitely have some big challenges here in the martial arts. Um, not and it's not really not really training, not 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 really training. Um, this is just, I guess you could say, the business side of the martial arts. And this is just me me being very candid here, very candid, very open and honest. Only very few people know this story, so I'm going to be sharing it with you guys, essentially. Uh, as I mentioned before. Um, I've, I've been here since I was 11, started in 95, you know, been here almost 30 years. I, um, got my black belt at the age of 16. I got my black belt at the age of 16, the year 2000, age 16. I, um, trained here since then, you know. Again, I came back from Florida in 2005, started teaching fully that that year, and I've been teaching consistently. And it wasn't just me. You know, we had other instructors here teaching as well. We had other instructors. But eventually, a lot of those guys started to trickle out. You know, they started to trickle out, you know, for whatever reason. You know, life, life happens. Life does happen. Life happens. 
So, you know, eventually it came up to a point where it was just me, the Grandmaster, and one of the other ones here, shout out to um, Professor Amin, you know, uh, Grandmaster got sick with ALS, so then it was just me and the Professor. Professor had a stroke, so then it was just me. So now we're talking, we're talking, um, 2000, between 2010 and 2012, you know, the responsibility of teaching fell onto me. It was just me. Um, and in that time, we had a couple of transitions. We moved from our first spot in Montclair to a spot further up the street in Montclair, which we got shafted out of out of some BS. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that one. That's a story for a different day. Uh, we went from that spot to a spot upstairs in that same building. Didn't last that long. 2013, we came down here to Bloomfield. And it was me teaching everything. You know, it was me teaching everything. And you got to figure around that time, you know, I just hit my 30s. You know, I just hit my 30s, so... And like any other adult, he was trying to just trying to find his way financially. I was trying to find my way to you know make money, you know to um make a financial living for myself. You know at that time, money was real short here at the dojo. It was real short, you know. So I had to find other ways to make money. You know, you know we usually do private lessons here. We would do private lessons, you know, so, but even those weren't really frequent. Um, had, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even think the Grandmaster knew this. You know, I, I worked, you know, the after school, even when I came back from Florida, I went back to the after school program and they hired me right back and I was working up and I was working with them up until 2010. 2010, they let me go. And they let me go because it seemed like I was spending a lot more time trying to be here or trying to make sure the dojo was running okay than at work. You know, they said, they literally told me that they needed someone to be there. And I wasn't really there a lot. You know, I cut down my days here and there. Because, I mean, not only was I at the karate school, but I was teaching different karate programs. You know, I was teaching a pro karate program in East Star. And I was teaching a I was, I mean, I had two different programs in East Orange. I was teaching, I mean, teaching a program in Roseland. This is all New Jersey, by the way. Teaching a program in Roseland. You know, I was, I was going to all these places. I didn't have a car. Um, so I was traveling, you know, to the place by public transportation. You know, Uber and Lyft weren't a thing at that time. They weren't, they weren't even thought of yet. So having to find a way to get to these places and not really making that much of money was starting was a little disheartening. Not only that, but I was also teaching practically all the classes here in the dojo. It it, it became a lot. It, it it really became a lot. You know, um again, those were the like early, you know, mid two thousands. And like I said, you know, two thousand thirteen we came down here. And again I was teaching all the classes. You know, I wasn't really making that much I mean I, I I mean I had the job with the school system I, I had officially gone to the school system in 2013 that's why I officially got into that and that was pretty good but again even after a while you get older you know there's more things you kind of want or that you kind of need so uh, it got to a point where it was just like I was essentially got to the point where I was trying to fit everything around this. And I realized that, like, really, I mean, I've always known that, but it wasn't until, like, really this summer where I realized that I've really been trying to put map, I've really been trying to map everything around this dojo. And to a degree, that's not fair. Not fair to me, and not fair to the other people in my life, and more specifically, not fair to my wife and my kid. Um, you know, around the time when we were still around the corner, you know, it, it, it got to a point where, 
you know, I had to figure out a way to get more money. I mean, like, I had to, at one point, I had to move out of my first apartment in Montclair. I had to move out because, you know, I wasn't making enough money. I had to move out. I had to put myself in the storage. At one point, I almost lost that storage unit. It wasn't for someone helping me or, you know, loaning me the money so I could save my storage unit. All the stuff that I previously owned would have been gone. It would have been lost. Um, you know, it, you know, again, full transparency, it, 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 um, drove me to do things that I would normally ever do to acquire money. You know, nothing sexual. Okay. Let's, let's just get out of the way. Nothing sexual, but you know, just things, you know, just resorting to things that I would never thought I would have to resort to just so I can take care of myself, you know, essentially, you know, you know, there are, there, 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 are, there are a lot of other factors, you know, starting to play into certain things around that time, you know, when the Grandmaster got sick, you know, he had felt the need to start promoting a lot of students to the next rank, you know, we had promoted a lot of the brown belts who stopped training for whatever reason to black belt, that was understandable because they never had a chance to go through the promotion, but after a while, it got to a point where he was just promoting anybody, you know, to honorary black belt or, you know, next rank and things like that and stuff. So, and to a point, it, to a point, it started to become a little excessive, you know, it really came to a point where we, like a lot of us really tried to tell like, we, we, we shouldn't be doing this. We should we we shouldn't be doing this. We can't we, we can't give an honorary black belt. I mean to everybody. And if we are, we can't be doing it with the invitation for them to just come and train in our black belt class. Our black belt class is a sacred class. It's for the people who train to get to that point. You know we can't open that class to everyone. You know, um, you know at the time, I was I was a. Uh, I got I got moved up to fifth degree. Um, go down. I got moved up to go down um, around a time when he promoted a lot of the other like at when the time when he promoted the brown belts who never got to go for black, black proponents, their honorary black belt. He promoted a lot of the other um, um, black belts too to their next rank. So I got moved up to fifth degree. Um, you know, it came to a point where he was giving out, you know six degrees to other black belts but he was having me do it and i remember shout out to um wazio jeff edwards he was our he's our archiver here at the dojo he's the one that keeps records of all a lot of the, a lot of the visual stuff here at the dojo but shout out to him you know he said he went to the grandmaster one day he said like you know having me stand there give these ranks to people who are not here helping out with the dojo isn't right and that was one of the other things too. Like I was, I, I really, I really was running the school. I was essentially running the, physically running the school by myself. You know, I was literally here every day, teaching all the classes Monday through Saturday. I was, you know, cleaning this dojo up, you know, making sure everything's there. I was signing up new students. I was really, I, I was running this dojo by myself. And essentially, I wasn't being compensated for it. You know, at the time, I chalked it up to, you know, medical expenses. You know, he said they had to load a lot of things at home, all that stuff. You know, I, I chalked it up to that. But at the same time, a lot of other people, a lot of other people around me were saying, like, that's not right. You know, it's not right for you to be te running the school and not being compensated for it. You know, again, that's where it came to times where I had to f do things that I wasn't I wasn't particularly proud of to try to acquire money. Um, you know, again, again, back to Roger Jeff Edwards. He um said he spoke with the grandmaster, and told him that it's not for it's not right for me to be having me present these degrees to people who I have not been helping. You know, so. He eventually he, he he eventually moved me up to six degree. He moved me up to six degree. So you know that 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 was that that was that was cool. But again, I was still dealing with the issue of like 
you know, not being able to make a living for myself. And at that time, you know, me and my now wife had started, I started, I had gotten together, you know, so, and she's, she's, she's a, she's a big, big proponent of you, of people being compensated for their work, you know, so, you know, it got to a point where I even got another job, you know, around that time, of course, you know, um, one of the older, one of the um, senior wazers came back, you know, when the professors came back, they struck a deal, you know, I was not made privy to the um, details of that deal, you know, honestly speaking, I was never really made privy to any of the business dealings at all around that time, so, you know, when they brought him back and a partnership to run the school, I was like, it's a little jarring, but it's okay, you know, if this is what the Grandmaster wants, then that's what is, that's what's going to happen. You know, but again, it came to a point where it was like, you know, me and my then, me and my girlfriend then, who was now my wife, you know, we we want we wanted we, we wanted to do things. We were we were looking to do things. You know, at the time, we were both living at our parents' house. I was living with my mom. She was living with her mom, and it's just like, no, nah, th- no, nah, we 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 have to, we have to make a change. You know, you know, so. You know, we wanted to get our own. We got. We wanted to get a spot for ourselves. We wanted to get a spot. We wanted to move in with each other. So, um, I found another job working at an after school program, literally right down the street from the right down the street from the karate school. You know, I was there Monday through Friday after school. I would come in Friday nights to teach the black belt class because that's when we moved black belt class to Friday nights. You know, you know, it came to a thing where it's like you know. They were kind of taken aback because of the fact that I didn't tell them that I was looking for another job. But, you know, at the time, I'm in my 30s. You know, I shouldn't really have to tell you if I'm looking for another job that I'm getting another job. You know, it's the fact that I need to make money. And, you know, at the time, my job at the school wasn't cutting it. It, it wasn't enough. And the money from here really wasn't enough it, it was barely even it was barely even anything you know so I, I made it is an executive decision to get another job that was going to take me away from here and I felt it wasn't going to be a big deal because you know there's somebody else running the school who's in charge of the school and they I figured they had it handled I would still be there when I needed to be there but you know, I needed to make a living for myself. Um, again, you know, we, we hashed that whole thing out. You know, we discussed the next steps, things like that. But, you know, you know, once once his son took over, you know, once the grandmaster's son took over, you know, we had a pretty good setup. It was three of us, me, him, and another one of the um, black belts. We were getting anything. Everything was cool. I was trying not to be back fully. You know, I was still working at the other job over there. You know, so I um, still needed to make money. I still needed to be able to take care of stuff. You know, so, you know, that was back in 2019. <laughs> that was 2019 before we got hit with the big vid. That was 2019 before we got hit with the COVID, with the um, pandemic. Um... You know, we came back from the pandemic. We fought through the pandemic. We, 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 we got through the pandemic pretty good. I know a lot of places didn't, but we got through the pandemic pretty good. Otherwise, we wouldn't be standing here right now. We got through it pretty good. You know, but again, it got to a point where now it was just like, um, again, it's just now. And at first, when it came back, it was me and, you know, the new head instructor. You know, or the Asatita, that's what we call them here. The Asatita means Asatita is Arabic and Hedesha, so it was me and Asatita, but then it just became me again. And it's been me again, just kind of teaching everything. I mean, I don't do a lot of behind the scenes stuff. I'm still the general manager of the school, but it was, it's been me teaching everything since, since then, honestly. Save for the times that I go away on vacation and stuff like that, but. Um, even now, you know, and like even this summer, you know, because we normally, we normally do a summer camp here, 
and the summer camp was scarce to say the least. Let's just leave it at that. It was very scarce and I was just here from morning till night doing the summer camp and teaching classes. You know, it, it, it got to a point where I I had to I had to call an audible. I had to be like, listen, I gotta I gotta break. I gotta take a break. I, I need I need at least two weeks to get myself rested, relax and caught up with stuff because I was essentially I was essentially putting my wife and my kids to the side to be here and you know my wife let me know she was vocal about it and she wasn't wrong but it's the fact that you know I was I was literally here almost every day when I should have been at home with them you know and I said, you know, school starts back up in two weeks from that day, and I, I had to, I had to take a break. I had to, I had to put this on pause because I needed to be home. And right now, that's the that's the next step. You know, the next step is for me, ideally, to not have to be here so much. You know, I. This is this is the balance that a lot of us talk about. This is the balance that a lot of us talk about in terms of anything you do, whether it's martial arts or sport or whatever. You have to find a balance. You know, my 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 um my my goal, honestly here, because again, this is a this is an institution that's been around for over forty years. How many schools, authentic schools, can say that? How many can say that? You know, I know the Asita right now, he has a grand vision for the school. And I want to help him get him there. I really want to help him get him there. But there's a lot of things that need to be worked out. A lot of things need to be worked out. On the business side, a lot of things need to be worked out on the business side. Because this thing could be expanded to a great degree. But a lot of things have to be discussed, you know. People's dynamics change with their life, you know. My my dynamic changed twofold when I got married and when I had my daughter, or when we had our daughter. My dynamic changed, and the long and short of it is, my focus has to be more on them. I mean, don't get me wrong. My focus will be here. My heart's always going to be here. I grew up here. You know, this is a place I don't want to see disappear. That's that's one of the reasons why I still am here. But I gotta think of my 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 family. I gotta think of them too. So ultimately, the goal the goal is again to find a better balance, to find a way for this to work with to work with my life as opposed to me for this to work around my life as the most as opposed to my life working around this that's the goal and this and this is this isn't sour grapes and this isn't you know me you know turning my back on this or anything like it's not that it's like everything requires balance everything so and balance is understanding what people dynamics are and how their how their dynamics are supposed to how their dynamics operate as opposed to yours so that's ultimately what what this comes down to so hopefully that's something we can achieve before the year is out going forward um Again, like I said, like I said before, this isn't saying that this is a, hasn't been a big part of my life. It's been an extremely big part of my life that I'm really trying to really share right now. Um, I would say I think one of the things I mean, there, I, I would have to say there's not too many misconceptions about the martial arts these days. Thankfully, thankfully, thankfully there aren't too many, but there are still a lot 
there's still a lot of general general ones that I would really like to like people to really dispel at this point like you know this isn't some sport like I said in the beginning of this this is a way of life and I feel like it's important that kids understand that because whatever they do as they get older is what they're gonna have to think about you know it's one thing to go for to play basketball football it's one thing to play a sport <clears throat> because you love it and you know you can make a great deal of money from it as a profession there's there's one thing to that that's understandable we understand that this I mean granted you can do the same thing with this you know it's very hard these days it, it, it's very hard but you can make a living from this as well whether you teach whether you train whether you train others whether you decide to act with this whether you decide to choreo choreo do choreography with this whatever you decide to do you can make money from this you can make pretty much make money from anything at this point right now so um but I just want people to understand everything you see on TV is not how this works. Even even Cobra Kai, to a degree, is kinda kinda adopting what real life martial arts is about into the series, but not so much. Um, this isn't just a kid thing. That I I think that's. One of the biggest misconceptions I would really want to dispel right now. There aren't too many, but that's the biggest one. I'm I, I'm I'm still tired of seeing people looking at this as like a like a kid activity. Like it's just something for kids to do. It's funny on Facebook I saw a post by um I forgot who the rapper was saying that he's tired of seeing all these older actors do action movies now. Particularly talking about people like Denzel Washington or Liam Neeson. Or Kevin Costner doing action movies right now and it's like he said he's tired of seeing older men doing karate on screen the thing I reply was saying first of all leave those guys alone if those guys want to do action movies in like their golden years let them I enjoyed the equalizer movies I enjoyed the first taken movie um three days to kill was awesome with Kevin because I don't mind seeing older and older men or older individuals doing action movies it's great do it and secondly, and this is the main thing, I need I need people, I need you guys to out there to understand this is not just some kid's activity. Like I said before, this is literally a way of life. My grandmaster used to always say, how you train is how you're going to be. It, it, it really is that simple. That goes with anything. This isn't just some kid thing. And like, oh, only that, who do you think is teaching the kids? Other kids? It's not other kids teaching, teaching the kids. It's adults. Which means they've had to train a long time to be able to give this information off to your kids. So we need to stop looking at this thing as just some kind of kids sport or kids activity. There are kids sports and kids activities. And there are schools and dojos that cater to just teaching kids. Again, that's fine. That's absolutely okay. But for us to still, for us in 2024, to really believe that like the martial arts is just some kids' activity for them to do in their free time, no. Mm -mm. We have to get rid of that misconception right now. We have to get that out of our heads. It's, it's not doing anybody any good. And for the parents that think that when they bring their kids here, I, 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 I'll say this. I'll say this. I treat people as they are. I treat people as they are. So, this is not to be mean or disrespectful, but if ultimately what your purpose in bringing your child here is for them to just have something to do, then that's how I'm probably going to treat them. Like, this is just something they, you know, are just here to do. You're just paying for a service. That's fine. That, 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 that's, that's absolutely okay if that's, if that's how you want to view this thing. That's okay. You know, I've always tell people like, you know, how I teach your child is how, is dependent on how, uh, is dependent on what your child, what your, 
I, how I teach students depending on what the student is trying to learn. If you're trying to do this for the long haul, if your goal is to go to the black belt and beyond, we can rock, we can work, we can go. But if you're here ultimately to be here for a short amount of time, then we can we can play that game too. We 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 can do that also, you know. You could do something that's going to occupy them for the time being. You know, I would eventually hope that you would reach a level where it's like, okay, I see what's going on here. I want to be fully immersed in this. That's okay. But if you just simply want to pay for a service, that's fine. And that's what you'll get. That's essentially what you'll get. You know, you got to remember, you know, if this is a business, you got to treat it as such, you know. We do, we do go above and beyond here. Most of the schools do, but if you want to keep this at face value, that's okay. That's, that's, that is not a problem. We can do that as well. That's okay. Um, some of my biggest role models, I would say in the martial arts, of course, Bruce Lee, of course, it, that goes with this show without saying, but even now, I still have a couple of martial arts. Michael Jai White, he's, he's one of my biggest ones. Michael Jai White is one of them. You know, Scott Atkins, he's another one. Jackie, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Donnie Yen, those guys, those all all those guys are my big martial arts, you know, role models. Um and I especially Michael Jai White, who 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 who's 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 really from this style. He's really from this lifestyle, you know. He lives this thing. So I see him and I see him doing what he's doing, and it's like, you know. I may not aspire to do all the things he does, but I aspire to reach that level at, at that point in his life where your martial arts is really taking you to a lot of places. Um, and all those other guys too. You know, I um, I do write. Many of you guys know who've been following me for a while. I do write, so I'm trying to get back into writing. You know, I've done choreography here and there, you know, have some movies that I want to make, so eventually I'm going to get to that point as well. Um, I can say I've never really been super injured. I've maybe jammed a finger, you know, messed up a toe or something like that, but I've never I've never broken anything. I've never broken anything. I've never lost a tooth here. I've never I mean I've I've had a bloody nose, but that was just from me. I, I did that to myself. But I've never had any serious serious injury from here. So I guess for that, you know, just definitely for that. Um I guess to just to just wrap this up, to really wrap this up, I would say um, for anyone, like I said before, for anyone looking to get into the martial arts, again, you're going to have to check your ego at the door. Be open and honest about what you want from this. And be ready to go all the way, honestly. Like I'm, again, we can't treat this like this is just some sport or after school activity. This really is a way of life. And the people who understand that this is a way of life tend to go very far. They usually tend to go very far with this. Like it it is encompassing is it's in everything they do, you see the martial arts in that. You know, and all the martial artists can recognize that. You know, you, you have to be willing to go all the way with this if that's what your ultimate goal is. But again, if you're looking for just some after school activity, you know, you can go somewhere where someone's teaching at a school or teaching at the YMCA or something like that. You can do that. But when you come to a dojo, when you come to a hall of training, get ready for the full experience and be ready for it. You understand? You have to be ready for it. Um, as far as a legacy and it's just interesting this is something I never really gave much consideration to about the legacy or the legacy I, I leave here but if I had to really speak on it I hope I mean first and foremost I, I want to I plan to do this for as long as I can physically I plan to do this for as long as I can physically. 
you know, so I can continue to give off knowledge and be here to help out the next generation of martial artists. Um, I hope that when I do leave this, when I do leave this, I want people to know that I I have I keep my martial arts here before I keep it here. My martial arts is always here when it's not when it's not here because I'm not using these all the time. Save for when I'm teaching or training. I'm not using these outside like that. You know, I'm using this. The martial arts is really up here. And I want the students to understand that. I want you guys to understand the martial arts is all in the mind and it's in the heart and it's in your spirit. You know, if you if you couldn't move your body, you would you'd still be considered a martial artist, even if you couldn't move your body. Our grandmaster couldn't move his body, but he's still one of the most dangerous people on this planet. I want it to be known that my first and foremost thoughts are always with the students. That's generally my top. My, my, I'm not even the top priority here when I come, when it comes to this. My my top priority is the students. That's that's who I that's who I want to that's who I focus on. That's who I want to make better. You know. I mean, yes, my journey is not over. My martial arts journey is not over, but I reached the goal that most people want to reach, which is the black belt. I'm there already. Now. I want to get pe other people there, and I want them to understand what there is that they're getting into. You know, and should anyone follow in my footsteps, as far as the martial arts, should anyone follow in my stuff that's keep, always keep in mind it's about balance. You know, I've given my I give myself to this, and I continue to give myself to this. But even now, I'm learning that. I have to give myself to the others around me as well, especially my family. I have, I have to give myself to them. You know, I made a commitment when I married my wife. And when our kid was born, I made a commitment to make sure that I gave her everything she ever needed. That includes me. It includes me. You know, so balance. Every, everything, everything in life is about balance, people. That's all it is. Everything in life is about balance. You got to be able to balance your work life from your home life to your social life. You know, I remember Grandmaster saying to me one day, he said, don't take your work home. Meaning this kind of, if you don't have to. Like he said, when you're here, focus on here. When you're at work, focus on work. When you're at home, Focus on home. Try not to bring your work home. When you're at home, home is for family and you. That's what you need to do. Um, but I think that'll do it for me, guys. Um, I hope this was a good in-depth look into me and my martial arts life. Um, I had asked people if they had any questions for me that they could submit it, but nobody really did. If you have questions for me after watching this, again, you could post it in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer them in like a quick clip, things like that. You know, again, um, the link to secure a slot on the Marshall Pods um, will be in the description box. I will put it in there. Uh, I have some. I have a guest lined up for the next two Sundays. This is going to be something I'm going to try to do every Sunday until the end of the year. So I have the next two slots booked already. So looking for those interviews. Um, I still got a couple more. So I'll put the link um, in the um, description box. So you can, you know, if you want to be part of the um, martial part series, if you're a martial artist, then I will definitely wouldn't hesitate to have you. Um, I know there's a couple of people I got to put in the um, docket. So be on the lookout for that. Um, the regular pod, the um, Dreadlock Blur Talk, will definitely be back at some point. Um, later on today, I'm going to record my review of um, my movie review for Beetle Juice, Beetle Juice. I saw, we, me and my wife saw that last night. It was, I'll tell you right now, it was funny. But my review will go for that later on. And like I said, I'm just trying to get back to more consistent content creating. 
or scratch that. I'm just trying to get back to more video making. More video making. That's what I'm trying to get back to. But I hope you enjoyed the first installment into the Marshall Pods series. Um, I'll be back next week with my next guest. Um, depending on how this works out, they will either be live, where you can ask questions live on screen, or it will probably be recorded. This is being recorded. So, uh, until then, I will catch you guys next time. And enjoy your day. Us.